Hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning, whichever one it is. Welcome to uh, ODI Fridays for our lunchtime lecture today. We are uh, really pleased to uh, welcome Luke Hazelwood, who is a researcher, and uh, Eleonora Harich from uh, uh, Reform, which is a think tank. Um, Eleonora is the Director of Research and Head of uh, Digital and Tech Innovation, which is a very long title, but very well deserved, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, Luke is a researcher, and they'll be uh, sharing their findings from a report they've been working on on data sharing in the public sector today. Uh, this is a topic that we are very interested here in here at the ODI. We've been doing a lot of work around uh, public services, specifically with local governments, so we're really interested to hear what you guys have been working on. Um, I'd ask uh, for audiences in the room and online if we could... Uh, uh, leave the questions to the end. We're going to be passing the mic around, and so we need people at home to be able to hear. And if you have questions at home, then please uh, tweet them in using the hashtag ODI Fridays. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miranda, and thank you all so much for coming here today. Um, I thought it might be worth starting off by introducing reform and what we do. So we're an independent uh, Westminster-based think tank focusing on public services. So we look at many different sectors, education, health, criminal justice and welfare and pensions. And we also do some cross-cutting themes. And uh, our, our reform's new paper sharing the benefits, how to use data effectively in the public sector is one of those things. So, so what is the paper about? It looks at personal data, which we define as pseudonymized, uh, personal identifiable and de-identified data and how if we share that between well, both within departments, government departments, and across different sectors, so education, health, uh, criminal justice, et cetera, um, how can that improve government services? How can that improve public services? But then what are the ethical challenges uh, around that? And what are the te technical challenges around that? So that's kind of a, a small introduction uh, of, of the project. Um, I'm one of the authors, my name is Luke Hesselwood. Um, Ellie Harwich, who's also with us today, is one of the, one of the co-authors, as well as uh, a former re uh, reformer, uh, Sarah Timmis. Um, the project took around eight to nine months. There's a lot of back and forth, different drafts, trying to get this 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 right. And and part of that was uh, thirty into. Ooh, I need to <laughs> the right slide. Uh, was uh, thirty different interviews with people from local government, from central government different departments, so the MOJ, the Home Office, DFE, et cetera, et cetera. We had quite a few techies that we interviewed to actually understand um, the possibilities, the, the data infrastructure, can we actually do this, as well as some of the policy issues. Why has this not been done yet? What are the issues in, term, in, in political terms standing in the way of this actually happening? And a lot of that might be surrounding uh, some of the ethics. We had an advice, and, and, and as well, in terms of the interviews, we also held, and, and, and we, we talk about this at the back of the report, we held a research event about halfway through where we, we got together about 10 different experts in the field, and we, we, we kind of presented where we were up to on the report and asked them to kind of comment and, and feedback. Um, we also had an advisory board who made regular comments on different drafts of the paper and really pushed us to kind of think about um, many different many different aspects of that. So one um, was called Rob Wilson, who's a professor of um, information and tech at Newcastle University, and Yvonne Gallagher from the National Audit Office. As well as as well as them, we also had three external reviewers. Um, we were quite keen with the external reviewers to kind of get out of the echo chamber, talk to some people who may maybe didn't ag agree with our understanding of data sharing. Um, and challenged us on the ethics of actually doing this, particularly when you're thinking around personal data. So why did we do this project? There were both internal reasons for doing it, there were also external reasons for doing it. So in, in, internally, we'd mentioned in quite a few different reports, um, data sharing would help with this, whether it was around higher education access, um, AI in the NHS, we, we would mention data sharing as a way to kind of solve some of these policy issues. So we really want to explore the implications of those recommendations. What is the infrastructure that has to be in place to make that happen? Um, how, how do we ensure that it is secure? And what are the ethics surrounding that? Um, so we really wanted to use this paper to set a blueprint for the future um, about how we actually think about data sharing. There's also external reasons. From 1999, we've not mentioned a few papers here. From 1999, um, the government started its uh, joining up agenda, looking at public services. So 
So ensuring, for example, there was more blue light collaboration between ambulances and fire and police services to ensure um, the best possible services for citizens. And, and throughout all these papers, so for nearly 20 years now, they've mentioned data sharing and improving data sharing as a way of, um, of actually achieving joined up services. So what we asked ourselves is why 20 years later has this still not happened? So that was some of the, the kind of um, key reasons to do it. And we asked ourselves this question, is it just all talk and no action? Um, so one of the things that we did notice doing this project as well, trotting through all of the documents that um, Luke just previously mentioned, was that actually the term data sharing was never really defined. Um, so the start starting point for this paper was to try and sort of find a um, common definition. Um, one of the things that we also wanted to do was a little bit of, I guess, sort of myth busting around that idea that data about myself, so me as a data subject, I am owner of that data and that there is an existence of a notion of ownership. When you look at data protection regulation, um, that notion does not appear. So it's because basically data is understood as a transactional relationship between the uh, subject of the data. So if the data is about myself, I would be the subject, the controller, who generally often uh, happens to be the sort of data collector and who basically decides who has access to it uh, or not, sometimes with the uh, consent of the subject, particularly to do with personal data, which was um, the topic of our paper, and then the person who processes that data. So that would be the person who gets to do all of the analytics around the data and derive uh, the sort of insights around it. Um, I guess sort of also one of the things that we wanted to sort of make quite clear is that the purpose for data sharing within an organization and between public service bodies can vary. Um, and I guess it's in that definition of what is actually the public benefit um, to share data that there can be some gray areas which sometimes people can be sort of quite reticent to share it because the public benefit can be a little bit, um, I guess, sort of difficult to, to describe or explain. And then another thing mm -hmm. that we wanted to um, have as a sort of starting point is really differentiating on a sort of very technical level the difference between having access to data and transferring data, that data sharing, given, um, given sort of current technology, there is no need for actual sort of physical moving of the data, but just a sort of access um, to it. Um, and then one of the things that we wanted to do, which Luke will be talking about now, is highlighting the sort of benefits um, around the different purposes for sharing data, as well as the costs. Whoops. Thank you. So I suppose the benefits of sharing data comes to the heart of why government talks about it so much and why government is so keen to, to get it right and to, to share more data. So um, we've got some e examples on the screen there, but what it really comes down to is it improves the efficiency of services. It helps, to under it helps uh, uh, public services to understand uh, complex issues that might face citizens, and also in terms of risk stratification and population segmentation, um, which I'll talk about. So in terms of the efficiency of services, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a, a random example. Um, if someone is suffering from mental health issues and the police is called, it might just be that through data sharing, what they actually need rather than the police is an ambulance. So it's things like that that, that data sharing could enable and, and could improve. Um, and a, gr a great example in Bristol is um, their BrizDoc service for, for homelessness people. Now, here in, in, in Bristol, what they're doing is they're connecting many different things, such as social care, health care, prison and probation, police data, to, to basically understand the complex needs facing the homeless population there. This can also improve risk stratification. So what do I mean by that? Rather than um, a service being a one-size-fits-all for everybody, it's tailored to those who actually need it. They can target and uh, target certain uh, people within like a local area or, or something more nationally to ensure that those people are the ones who actually receive care, who receive um, the, the, ben the benefits of this. No problem. So in, the, as well as the benefits, there's also a cost of not doing this. So there's many... Um, quite tragic examples where data hasn't been shared and as a result, certain citizens have not received the, the care that they need. 
A simple example is um, from Manchester. So the Manchester are, are, are like trying to set up this information sharing agreement at the moment. And they use this example of this elderly man who was unable to get a wheelchair simply because different services weren't talking to each other. So that might be social care. It might be the healthcare services um, from different hospitals not communicating together and therefore he, he was unable to actually get the help that he needed. So there's both benefits to sharing data, there's also costs to not doing so. So then we ask ourselves the question of um, why is this not happening more often or um, at scale? Um, and it basically has to do with the fact that Government has focused a lot on trying to have the sort of legal infrastructure, which we've sort of painted in um, this graph with the sort of Digital, Digital Economy Act, um, also the GDPR um, and so on. So the legal infrastructure is there and there are sort of um, legal recourses that can be used, such as um, legal gateways to, to share data between uh, different organizations and within an organization. Um, there is also a strategy around it and there's quite a lot of focus on I guess how we, we could colloquially say the sort of fluffy, snazzy, sexy tools around the sort of analytics, AI, blockchain, all of that. But the really sort of core of the issue lies within the data infrastructure. And this is sort of both a sort of technical um, conversation to be had, but um, also more of a sort of social one, um, as we sort of pointed to the side with the sort of culture around data sharing and the sort of need to collaborate. Um, so in terms of the sort of data infrastructure from a sort of technical perspective, we're both talking about the um, sort of need for um, what is known as sort of structural interoperability. So this has a lot to do with the standardization of data within um, different departments so that if ever you sort of transfer, uh, oh gosh, sorry, have access to data, sorry, um, you, you um, actually can make sense of it. Um, and then there's also the functional interoperability of um, the sort of issue, which has to do with the capacity of systems to actually be able to sort of communicate with each other, um, which is sort of quite complicated. Um, and so we sort of defined the problems underlying um, the reasons, I guess, why we haven't sort of managed to, to build a um, data infrastructure along these sort of different points. So around um, sort of data, which is a sort of crux of it, we're talking about issues around interoperability. There's also issues around sort of legacy data and how you sort of come uh, to deal with that. Issues around um, data quality, but also sort of imbued in that is how do you create a sort of trustworthy infrastructure, one in which people um, actually trust that their data is uh, being shared appropriately? How do you sort of correctly engage with them to make sure that they are obviously part of this um, sort of debate. Um, there's also a question around sort of demystifying legislation. Um, so what we often heard in the sort of interviews that we carried out for this paper is that it's sort of in, in within legislation, it's sort of very clear, um, clearly defined, I guess, the sort of sanctions that can sort of happen if ever you misuse data. And that is sort of seen as the main reason why there is quite a lot of risk aversion around sharing uh, data between different organizations when it can actually sort of be used as a tool to um, empower people to understand how you should actually go about ethically sharing data between different organizations. So I think there's a sort of big education piece around um, what legislation allows you to do um, and a sort of clear case to demonstrate sort of areas of best practice that people can sort of learn from. And then obviously overlapping all of these layers, there's a question of sort of leadership and basically who's gonna drive <coughs> um, this sort of agenda cross government. Um, so around data, we, so the report, sorry, makes uh, 13 recommendations, um, which we think could sort of make way to sort of help um, this sort of agenda in government. Around data, we can sort of classify the recommendations around sort of three different points. Um, one around access. So one of the things that came up quite a lot uh, in the sort of literature and interviews that we carried out was that it's sort of very hard to know what type of data uh, different public sector organizations actually hold and actually make requests that abide by the data minimization principle, have a sort of um, understanding of what it is that you exactly need from another organization. <coughs> so sometimes requests are made a little bit at sort of random 
kind of like, well, maybe you should request this. Um, so one of the recommendations that we made around that um, is that public sector organizations can offer synthetic data sets um, so that other organizations can understand the standards that they use, the information that they might need uh, to then be able to make access requests more accurately. Um, and this can also potentially go some way to solving the um, structural interoperability issues towards understanding, well, what standards do people use in different organizations? Then there's a the whole question around quality. Um, and we made a few recommendations around that, um, which is that we think that um, the NHS who developed a sort of data quality assurance toolkit can be, um, well, actually sort of spread throughout um, different public sector bodies. Um, where they should submit data to be tested and sort of, um, sorry, organization, public sector organizations should submit uh, data to be tested in order to understand what are the data quality issues that these organizations are facing. Um, and then we also um, recommended um, a sort of seal of approval that could be created to understand if um, there are sort of, I guess, certain biases within data sets or reasons, or if there are any sort of, I guess, ways of understanding what the known unknowns are within data sets so that you can understand how you can go about um, imputing um, for missing data in the most appropriate way so that you try and mitigate bias within um, government data sets. Um, and then Obviously, there's a the big issue of interoperability of systems um, within public sector organizations, and this is really quite big, um, and they're quite well known. So, for example, the police use two different types of, um, well, basically sort of databases. There's the Police National Computer and Police National Database, and those have notoriously never managed to really sort of communicate and share information. Um, so one of the ways to, to sort of overcome this is to ensure um, that um, well, basically, sort of technology vendors actually um, manage to um, have their products be sort of compatible with uh, relevant APIs, so that we can be able, so that we can sort of layer, sorry, um, application programming interfaces to be able to sort of access data at different points um, within different uh, organizations. And then moving forward, I think it should be something that um, should be changed in procurement rules um, because that is obviously the way that we go about um, buying all of these IT systems and making sure that you basically mitigate against the situation which we're in right now, which is a lot of vendor lock-in where the data can't really sort of be um, shared or accessed in, in sort of any way. Um, then, as I had mentioned, the issues around um, trustworthiness and trying to demystify legislation. So here we made um, a few recommendations around uh, public engagement. Um, the sort of main one being um, that governments should learn from the sort of successes of initiatives like understanding patient data that make sort of very engaging uh, videos and communication around uh, well, I guess sort of how patient data is actually used and that is something that could be um, sort of more widespread to understand the sort <coughs> of need and what that actually would mean to the person uh, to be able to, to sort of share information. Um, we also made recommendations around the auditability of systems. So this is about understanding how data has been shared between different organizations and having a sort of audit trail of them, understanding who has accessed that data and for what purpose. Um, and there's also, and this is, this is, I think, sort of quite the sort of potentially more difficult one, was it, which is, has to do with training um, as a potential tool to change the culture around um, data sharing. So we have recommended that um, the ICO um, investigate uh, basically how long, what, what's the sort of optimal time for a training course for people to be able to sort of change their behavior around um, sort of data sharing, if it be sort of three days, there have been some reports that have been done around that, um, to really train um, people within public services to, to feel confident about um, using data. Um, another thing that we sort of pointed out in the report is the very good work that the Center of Excellence for Information Sharing, which no longer exists, um, 
which uh, had a lot of case studies and, and almost functioned like a sort of central repository of information about the sort of best practice and the different hurdles that different um, public sector organizations have tried to go through when they tried to have sort of multi-agency sharing, data sharing agreements. Um, so that was actually sort of quite, quite an interesting um, sort of initiative and we've basically said that we think it, it sort of needs to be pursued. Um, and now Luke is going to talk about the recommendations that we had around leadership. Thank you very much. Um, so underpinning all of what Ellie has just been talking about, to make all that happen will require leadership. And we've kind of highlighted three, three things here. So they need to be championing data sharing and data sharing policies across government. There has to be collective responsibility. This can't just be one department leading the way and everybody else dragging their feet. And it needs to be scaled up. So if there are good examples happening in a local community, one of which I'll mention, if it's going well, that, that might be able to be scaled up if, if, it, if it's necessary, and the data will be able to drive that. Um, I was just talking before around tailored data. So if, if it's something that would have uh, a need just in that local area, it's OK that it would stay in that local area. But if it has the potential to be scaled up and have a national benefit, and it should be able to do that as well. So in the government's recent transformation strategy, um, it said that it was going to set up a, a new data advisory board by 2020 and uh, appoint a new chief data officer. So in terms of the data advisory board, um, we said it, that it should be focusing its attention on tackling the difficult challenges stopping effective multi-agency data sharing. And there should be a representative from every single department within that data, uh, data advisory board. And that is to ensure that they have collective responsibility and it's not just one department doing it. Um, we've had a chief data officer before uh, and they're, they're talking about getting a new one. We're, st we're still working that out. Um, and, and we're saying that within their remit, um, they should have specific uh, kind of control over the data sharing policy of the government. So you both have this data advisory board and you have a specific person in ch who, who the government said that they're going to appoint to be in charge of that. Um, in, uh, another recommendation we had was around what department should be taking the lead if there is one to be taking the lead. Currently it's DCMS. Um, Matthew Hancock, when he was at DCMS, was doing a lot around data sharing and, and, and now for they're, 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 they're taking the lead on that uh, with the new Centre for Data Ethics. What we were concerned about, and, and this came, came through in a lot of the interviews that we did as well, was if it was in DCMS, it might not have the kind of authority to be widespread across government. And we thought the department that was best to do that was the cabinet office, where data sharing policy was before. But we think in tandem with the data advisory board and the new ch chief data officer, that could work. And in terms of scaling it up, um, there are many examples across local government doing great stuff around data sharing. Um, so in Calderdale, for example, they've set up uh, a, ch a children's, uh, they, they're looking at data to improve children's services. Now something like that could be scaled up and they've written in their report, this has the potential to be scaled up uh, and this could provide a template model. So having uh, the possibility of local government and the regions building up uh, data infrastructure that could be applied to a national level is something that w we recommended in this report. And I think, uh, as I said before, all this needs to be underpinned by uh, leadership um, and accountability to ensure that d the data sharing agreements actually get off the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have we got any questions to kick off with? The audience, is that one that's back there? Okay, uh, I mean, uh, do you have uh, some practical example where you, I mean, pilot project, uh, I mean, focusing all the steps, including interoperability up to the strategy at the government level? Did you develop some really, uh, let's say, we can say pilot project or demonstration project yes. where we can see what... Uh, so we, we don't uh, deal with implementation. So we, we are a think tank. Um, and we haven't sort of started a project from scratch with local authorities and gone all the way up, if that's what you mean, because that is not the remit of our work. 
We have seen that, though, um, I guess sort of the examples that Luke had mentioned um, earlier on. So, for example, the Briz Dock um, in Bristol, where they have managed to not only sort of find the sort of legal gateways to be able to provide um, services for people facing uh, homelessness um, and sort of join up all of those dots. Um, and so, so examples like that, there, there are pockets of it, and that's some of, I guess, one of the things that we wanted to showcase in, in, in this report. That's why I come at the question, because what I think is missing there is uh, the platform itself. So in this data infrastructure, they should uh, say, be in some kind of IT platform, yeah. reference platform, in order that this is the basic of all dri driving the process at the end. Yeah. Wh where is there? I mean, it's a data infrastructure, but not the platform reference for the data infrastructure for all the other steps that you mentioned. Yeah, there. so I think that was the point basically of just saying in this report that the big piece that is missing is, th is that exact thing that you're mentioning, which has to do with the actual sort of platform, the actual infrastructure to be able to do these things. Because basically you find sort of examples of good, good practice in sort of different areas, but they're sort of still also struggling themselves with actually sort of building that, that infrastructure because of issues around data quality, around interoperability, around all of those things which have to do with sort of standards and actually making sense of data. Specifically for um, people facing homelessness, there's also quite a lot of missing data. Um, and it's actually quite important to be able to understand the reasons for missingness, because if not, it's, it is a clear sort of gap in our understanding of what their needs are. So yeah, I, I, I would say I'd completely agree with you that that is the sort of main piece missing. I'm just wondering where you see the role of safeguarding might sit in your recommendations. Like as much as there's um, a lot of benefits to data sharing, you know, there can be a lot of issues. I think of an example of, I can't remember which charity it was, but you know, they had been reporting back to the Home Office about homeless people. Um, so it kind of, you know, there's obviously avenues for what public might consider misuse but effectively led the legislation might actually deem that to be legal so yeah i'm just wondering in terms of there's demystifying legislation but what happens if the public don't actually agree with that in this model is there a safeguarding aspect to yeah so i think the sort of well so that, that is actually the, the sort of home office example is, is the one one that we sort of mentioned in i guess the sort of difficult ethical conversations that you need to be um, having around <coughs> sharing information. Um, I think the sort of main response to that is the continuous sort of public engagement that is something that you really cannot do without the public support and sort of understanding around those sort of ultimately this is two different organizations having sort of different aims and maybe sort of different incentives sort of clashing um, and I think that that yeah should only be sort of public resolution of, of that sort of incentive conflict. Thank you. Jenny Hotchin from Pinsent Masons. Um, just picking up on that point, um, I think the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation potentially could do some really amazing work in terms of public engagement, mm -hmm. engaging what the public generally feel comfortable, comfortable with and with what it. they don't. And I think that part and education is going to be absolutely key. Mm -hmm. um, and the centre is new, so we'll see what we uh, what comes through in the next 12 months, but potentially could answer a lot of the, the points that you've highlighted. Um, the other thing we've been looking at is um, data sharing um, frameworks and um, how that can be set up contractually um, and how that may work. So looking data trust sort of being a subset mm -hmm. of that. And I think, again, potentially... Um, as those conversations develop, and it may be the Centre uh, for Data Ethics and Innovation helps with that, um, and also supported by the AI Council. So hopefully yeah. we're seeing some really good work come through there. Um, but I just want to agree um, that I think um, a project for sort of national data architecture um, and then infrastructure on the back of that is absolutely critical. Um, and we need to be able to get the benefits that um, you know are potentially amazing. Um, we need to make sure that we get that architecture set up and totally agree in terms of um, what you're saying in terms down the road in terms of procurement and things like that. Um, I think there's talk of um, starting a sort of national data architecture program, but I wondered if you'd had any, if you knew anything else as to where that was going. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> no. I wish we did. <laughs> but unfortunately, no, no. 
Um, no. Any more questions? Yeah. One at the back and then. So I just wondered about the uh, intractable challenges possibly with um, historic data sets and mm -hmm. lots of you know public sector databases may have been running for sort of 20 years and be really obsolete and um, if you what information you've got about the, you know practically the challenges of integrating those into synthetic usable shareable yeah. systems um, even if there were if there was the will and the commitment to do that no of course um, so I think legacy data is an issue that is you know, not only facing the public sector, it's something that the private sector has also had to face. I guess the main difference between the two is that the private sector can sometimes decide, well, you know what, we're going to implement a new infrastructure and start from scratch. So they don't need to deal with that question. And I don't think that up until now, we haven't seen sort of any easy, quick fixes to that, because that is going to take quite a lot of time to be able to migrate what I guess the sort of old standards were corresponding to the new ones and being able to map them out. I don't think that there is a sort of magic solution to that. It, that is it just going to take quite a lot of work, really. Um, there are some standards for uh, leaked data, and um, I'm wondering if you have considered the need for understanding the existing data and appropriately modeling it in that uh, intent. So, sorry, the, the beginning bit was so standards in, in what th type There are standard languages to model linked data. Linked data? Yes. Okay. So, uh, and the it, it's uh, required to rely on common standard mm -hmm. languages mm -hmm. to, to be able to make the data interoperable. Mm -hmm. But also, I think the legacy data mm -hmm. is sometimes hard to understand. Yeah. And um, Oops, sorry. I, I think the main exercise to make things better would mm -hmm. be to have a nice and open modeling of the data. Uh, how, how much have you how much thought have you given that in, in your um, recommendations? <laughs> um, so I think some in the sense that what, I mean, we've sort of looked at, um, I guess, some interoperability systems like FHIR, which is used in, in sort of health to be able to sort of map out um, the different uh, ways of going about coding um, um, sorry, the clinical coding, sorry, of, of, of data, um, if, if I'm sort of understanding your question correctly. Um, so there are initiatives around that, but we haven't looked at the sort of technicalities of exactly how do you, would you do that within the entire sort of cross-government approach of, of it. I don't know if that's sort of fully answering your, your question. Though. No? No, Please I'm go just, for it. Yeah. I mean, yes, it's beginning of an answer. I'm just hinting towards data modeling is, is key. Yeah. To yeah, well, that, that I, I guess is sort of what we mean when we look, when we say, when we've sort of made recommendations around sort of the need for standards and having sort of that conversation to really be able to, to achieve that sort of st structural interoperability of systems, is, if that's sort of what, what you're sort of getting at. Yeah. That, sorry, no, yeah, I, I'm just agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> um, championing. It would be interesting to know how far you think the championing should go down the organization and what is the optimum unit. I'm interested in this yeah. because in the first decade of this century, I was heavily involved with the land registry, mm -hmm. which went into a database from a registry, gave up paper titles for the first time since the Doomsday Book, and got away with it. But one thing that they did was that everybody who had supervisory responsibility within the organization was trained in training, and everybody who had public-facing jobs was also trained in training and change management. Mm -hmm. Really, is that going too far, or do you think that every organization should now adopt that view, that approach. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Um, 
what would be my response to that? I think, well, I mean, I think obviously it can't be something that is completely disjointed because even if sort of decisions are, or let's say might be taken sort of at the top, the oper operationalization of it will obviously come sort of through lower, um, I guess, sort of pe people on the front line. So I, I guess there is a sort of sense of needing that engagement from sort of every single layer. I guess that that is also the sort of question around, I guess, the sort of appropriate training that you need to sort of really be able to understand what you need at sort of every single layer of the organization, because you might, I guess, the sort of need might be sort of different at the top. You might just be sort of championing the broad goals of that agenda. And then you maybe have the sort of, I guess, technical layer of the organization so who obviously sort of needs to be championing that from sort of their specific perspective. So you might have sort of different layers of understanding if 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 you see what I mean. But I, I do I do think that it is something that should be collective, that you can't just have someone at the very top understanding this without the sort of drivers um, on the ground because ultimately that's that's sort of <coughs> people's I mean, your first really the staff. Yeah. Mm. Any more questions? Yep. Um, you made a point around the training being one of the key issues mm -hmm. uh, and one of your recommendations for the future in terms of data sharing and understanding some of those processes and roles and responsibilities and so on. Sharing, I guess, m it's maybe more a comment than a question, mm -hmm. but sharing the information is one thing, but actually understanding what to do with it yeah. and how to release those benefits. Yeah is is a different is issue it, yeah it's related to be sure um and given the age of austerity and the fact that a lot of those kind of analytical staff within local authorities of the public sector organizations have now gone mm. if they existed at all where do you see that's going to require investment to release those benefits do you have any views on that uh, I, I mean i would i would just say that i so the sort of i guess point around the difference between having insights and then making sure that those insights are actually actionable and people actually acting upon them is is something that you know there is quite a lot of rich literature around and I would completely agree um, that's actually a sort of section that we added to the paper which is it's not just about the data it's being able to action upon these um, so I think there's a two part answer to, to sort of your question. One which is around, I guess, the design of a lot of these systems um, and make them sort of more usable. Um, so I guess a sort of typical example would be the sort of design of electronic health records, which sometimes can be sort of quite tedious to, to sort of fill out. Um, so making them, making that more usable or for example, in social services, you could imagine um, sort of dashboards being created so that you understand the sort of temporality of events so that you can target interventions earlier. So there's a question around, I think, the way that the information is presented to really empower people, because this is not just a question of opening sort of multiple data sets and then aggregating that information yourself, which is currently a lot of what's happening. And that is obviously sort of very difficult to do. Um, and I guess the sort of point around investment, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think that there's any way around it, really, that it is going to need money for it. Any more questions? Right. Uh, I've got one final question, oh, which please. is where can we find the report? Uh, well, on our website. <laughs> <laughs> Just from your homepage? Just from our homepage. It should okay. be sort of still appearing in the recent publications uh, page. So Brilliant. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. No, thank you, you for having us. And Luke. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you.